I'd like to welcome you to the first of 10 Wednesday weekly webinars. So once you've gotten this figured out how to get into the system, we're going to use that same link every week for the next 10 weeks. I'm Julie Garden Robinson. I'm a food and nutrition specialist with the Department of Health, Nutrition, and Exercise Sciences and an extension specialist for NDSU. And I'll be introducing Keith Knutson a little bit more closely in a couple minutes here, but I have a couple logistics I'd like to share. So these are the upcoming webinars. Um, please note these on March 2nd next week, Todd Weinman, an extension agent in Cass County, will be presenting on using high tunnels to extend the growing season. And you can see the remaining um, eight after Todd. So please plan to join us and I hope that these are very helpful. This is kind of a new endeavor for at least my subject matter area. So we're always wanting to improve, so you know, let us know. Uh, one thing I will ask you to do is fill out a short survey and I'm going to drop that into the chat pod at the end and uh, we'll also send it out by email. So a few logistics, it looks like you're figuring out what to do if you've never used this before. Um, you found the smile and the hand, most of you. Uh, be sure to look for that chat pod. If you have questions as we're going along, as Keith is progressing in his talk, just type your questions in that and Keith will take all your questions at the end. Everyone will be in listening mode so that we don't get any feedback. So again, we'll have a short survey. I promise it's really short. And one nice thing you'll be able to print out if you'd like is a certificate of completion at the end. And I also popped in a little prize survey. So if you enter your name and address into the separate survey that pops up after we, you finish the really short survey, then you have a chance to win a prize. So I hope that's a little enticement. We really need your, your feedback because all of this was sponsored by a grant proposal. So again, today's presenter I'm happy to introduce is Keith Knudsen, who is a farm business management instructor at Dakota College at Botno. And he'll tell you a little bit more, but his main areas of specialization are farm business management, sustainable vegetable production, and aquaponics operations. So with that, I'm going to pass it over to Keith. And again, type your questions into the chat pod. Hello everyone, this is Keith Knudsen from Dakota College in Baton Rouge. Um, it's, it's, I always enjoy talking about food safety because I think it's important to a lot of uh, everyone that, that I visit with all the time, especially producers. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the Food Safety Modernization Act and I'm not going to talk about rules and regulations and all of that, but rather I'm going to kind of pick those special main topics that the Food Safety Modernization Act uh, looks at and try to go through those with you so that you have an understanding of those different areas. Just want to step back a little bit. Julie mentioned that, I, that I'm a farm business management instructor and I am through the North Dakota Career Tech and Education Program. And I work mainly with specialty crop producers and small farmers across the state of North Dakota. Especially crop producers, mainly with vegetable and fruit production producers, and helping them write business plans and uh, record keeping and year end analysis and planning for the next year. So um, that's one of the main areas that I cover. I also cover a, a vegetable sustainable vegetable program here at Dakota College. And uh, a few years back, the legislature decided to select areas for centers of excellence and, and Dakota College was selected for the Entrepreneurial Center for Horticulture. And so we do have a, a great vegetable, sustainable vegetable program. And this year we just started an aquaponics program. And uh, aquaponics is two things. Aquaculture, which has to do with raising fish or aquatic life, and then hydroponics, which is probably most of you know as a is growing plants in a in a soilless type environment with some kind of a substrate with uh, nutrients that flow by it. So 
<clears throat> the aquaponics is not new by any means, but it's something that seems to have caught on a lot of a lot of people are interested in how that all works. So with that I will proceed. If there's any problem that you have with hearing me, please just type in the chat box and we'll work there. Otherwise, um, put your questions in and then I will get to those at the end of the slide section. First thing I want to talk a little bit about is definitions. You've probably heard of GAFs or good handling practices or good manufacturing practices. And good manufacturing practices, you've probably heard the word, or the, it said it's GIMP or that type of thing. And, and so just want to go through those today with you. Um, good agricultural practices is mainly what we're going to talk about today in this session. And that has a lot to do with raising fruits and vegetables on the farm. And uh, good handling practices then typically falls in place after we harvest the produce and going forward up to the point where we sell it to the consumer or we sell it for manufacturing purposes. And then of course that falls into good manufacturing processes, which typically is something like canning or freezing or making juice or pastas or that type of thing. Um, and then the final definition I'll talk about, which is what we really here today, is the Food Safety Modernization Act. Back in January 2011, Obama signed the Food Safety Modernization Act. And it's actually taken us a few years since that act was put into place to really, to really get an understanding of what it means to everybody and to make sure that everyone, whether you're a producer, or you're a manufacturer or you're an inspector, can all live with the, the requirements that we have in place. So we've gone through a number of sessions over the last two or three years trying to define what each one of the requirements means exactly. And when it first came out, there was a lot of skepticism, a lot of scare on what it really meant. But I think we've worked through most of that now. And as I proceed through the this webinar, you'll see that um, it's probably not as scary as we originally thought it would be. So the Food Safety Modernization Act really covers six areas. And the, the areas we're going to talk about is the, the first five areas. The sprouts I'm not going to say much about today, but the Food Safety Modernization Act um, really kind of selected sprouts out. And, and the main reason for that is, is the way sprouts are grown. They're grown typically in a controlled environment with with a temperature and humidity condition, conditions that are really similar to what a lot of microorganisms, pathogens like. And so there's there's a lot of extra precautions that we need to do uh, when we when we do consider raising sprouts. So I'm not going to talk much about and not talk any more about sprouts in that because I think the other areas are, are what most of us are concerned about. So the other areas, worker training and health and hygiene, agriculture, water, biological soil amendments, and, and biological um, is just a part of it. We will actually talk about soil amendments in general. Domesticated wild, wild animals and then equipment, tools, and buildings. So let's get right into the, to the meat of this. Um, when we do, when we think about food safety, whether there's a regulation in place or not, as growers, it's our responsibility to recognize any sources that we probably that we would have for contamination. And the new Food Safety Modernization Act looks at things differently than we have looked at things in the past. In the past, we've talked about corrective action, and corrective action being okay. We've got this problem. Where did the problem come from? And where is all the contaminated, we'll say in this case, tomatoes? Who's got those? And how can we segregate those? How can we get those back up, out so that get away those away from the consumer so that they do not consume that tainted uh, produce? So the Food Safety Modernization Act goes one step further and it goes into what we call preventive action. Preventive action is when we're looking at 
what are the possible issues that we can come up with on our farm or in our business that may affect uh, the food itself, affect contamination, food safety, that type of thing. So the Food Safety Modernization Act really wants you to think ahead, to think about what you're doing today, what you can do to put things in place that will prevent issues with food safety. The other part of that is, and it's not really in the Food Safety Modernization Act, but it's really, really important when you think about it, especially as a producer, we want to re reduce our risk. And so risk management is a very important part of this whole picture. And, and so we do certain things on our farm to reduce risk at all times. And I'm not just talking about getting liability insurance. I'm talking about how we do things on farms so that we ensure that our food is safe. And we'll talk more about that. So let's get right into some of the areas. The first one that we talked about, mentioned was workers, worker hygiene. And workers are actually the major source of uh, pathogens. And mainly it comes because of our, our hands. When we're handling the fruits and vegetables all the time, uh, we're handling other types of processed food. So we need to make sure that we have proper hygiene right from the very beginning. And when we talk about that, um, we talk about toilets and we talk about hand washing stations. Those are all very important. And of course, along with that, in order to ensure that we know we're doing things consistently, a lot of times we want to have, we want to keep records. We want to say, yes, we check this, we check this every day, or we check this every week. Uh, we check our cooler temperatures every day, and we check our cooler temperatures every week. And here's proof that we do it. And it's it's a good way for us to say, oh, wait, we missed yesterday. Let's make sure we get back on track. And so it's part of that whole preventive measure. So when we talk about health and hygiene, let's just go through some of the things. Uh, sick employees. Sometimes we don't always know when we had a sick employee around us. Like, and, and if we're a small producer, we may be the only employee that's there that day. But uh, it's important that if we do have a sick employee, that th that individual is not handling produce or the food. So that doesn't necessarily mean that we need to send them home. There may be things that they can do outside of, of handling the food or harvesting that uh, would not affect the food safety itself. And so there may be things like uh, sleeping or maybe maybe uh, mowing or something outside of the, the regular handling of the foods that we could have an employee do. Some employees uh, may not tell you they're sick just because they think you will force them to go home. So we don't want to get in that situation either. So we want to know when our employees are sick. We want to know how to best handle the situation whether they want to go home or they want to continue to work. Uh, employees with open cuts or scrapes is another issue. They may be working, picking produce, they get cut. We want them to stop right away, of course, and, and let us know about that. And we always want to try to contain bodily fluids as much as we can. So if they're bleeding, we want to make sure they stop. We want to make sure that if they pick some food that may have uh, blood on it that, that we are able to segregate that fruit and get it away from the other fruit so we don't contaminate everything. That's not to say again, again, that we have to send them home. We can send them off to do something else. If, um, if they're not bleeding real bad or if the bleeding is stopped, the best thing to do is put a Band-Aid on and, and maybe have them wear rubber gloves or something so that they can continue doing what they're, they're doing. But it's always important that we first take note of of the employee safety and then and then also make sure that we segregated anything that may have been contaminated. The third one I just threw in there, but it's amazing how much how much we touch our face during the course of the day. And so that potentially is a source of contamination, not necessarily. There have been times when I have had people tell me that inspectors have told them they must wear gloves when they're picking fruit. Yet at the same time, I see them touching their face. So um, there is always that issue of contamination 
So when we're talking to our employees or we're thinking about ourselves, those are things that these type of things should come to light to us and we try to minimize it. It's, it's not that we're going to totally control the situation and eliminate the problem, but we minimize it, which is most important. Of course, we have employees who um, so sometimes you want to wash their hands after using the restroom. It's important that we constantly tell them to wash their hands. We don't always tell them after they walk out of the restroom. It's much better to tell them in a session, in a training session before um, that happens. Same way with uh, any time they come to work with, with hands, if they're handling produce, they're out pulling weeds in the morning, or early morning, and then later in the morning they go out and, and pick produce. It's always wise to, to let them know that they should wash their hands and and then you need to provide that kind of a wash station to them too. So, um, handling areas where we're keeping the, the food, we should make sure that that area is clean. And and sort of clothing is another one. It's often times where we probably went to work one day and the next day we slip on the same clothes and come back to work again. And um, if you have employees, always advise them to. Wash your clothes and put clean clothes on every day. They don't need to have clothes that are in perfect shape, but they should be washed and clean. Here's just a little a little uh, chart that you could put up if you've got a, a bathroom someplace, and it just goes through the steps of hand washing. A lot of times, I think we we think if we just rinse our hands in water, we're good to go, but that's not necessarily the best thing. First of all, um, we use soaps a lot of times, and soaps will help sanitize, may help sanitize when we get most of the dirt off. But we should also remember that we need to scrub our hands really well and, and do it for at least 20 seconds. And of course, then rinsing is important, and then drying, and then uh, trying to reduce any contamination as much as possible by turning off the tap water with the towel that you just used. We, I mentioned a little bit about an outside workstation. And so if you have employees and you have them using a restroom, that type of thing, uh, make sure that you have something available for them to wash their hands. And this is just a very simple type of uh, situation. I've seen this on the end gates of pickups where you've got a uh, water is kind of a free-flowing free type of water jug where you can actually lift, lift the lever and let the water flow over both hands at the same time and then drop the lever back down. Of course, you got to have a catch bucket. The catch bucket is important because otherwise you get mud and you get contamination, you get tracking back and forth to the fields and to the areas where you're, you have your production. Soap is important, paper towels, and of course, garbage can is important. So. That's uh, all of that is is almost a must if you're going to have employees and you're going to have them doing several different things, including uh, working with food or produce out, out in the field. Very simple little way of, of making sure that you take care of the water. There's a question in the chat box. The next mm -hmm. section, water. Water is a uh, Water is probably the most rapid way of getting everything contaminated that you could ever imagine. And, and uh, one example that I've seen over and over again is that we have uh, wash stations where we're maybe dipping our lettuce into the wash station and, and we're rinsing off the dirt. But um, at the same time, if we had an issue, a contamination issue, maybe some pesticide overflow or something, we get that lettuce into that water and, and then the water is not contaminated. So from that point on, you know, we, that issue will be with all anything that we get in there. So, uh, But I'm just going to go through these. Irrigation is, is always one of those things that we may have contaminated water. If we have hoses or pipes that we use for irrigation, it's always important that we make sure we drain our pipes, try to get them as dry as possible because inside that pipe, if we have some water sitting, then there's potential for microorganisms. And the next time you use your sprinkler system, then you're sprinkling out 
microorganisms and, and not to say that all microorganisms are bad. Most are not. Most bacteria is not bad, but it's just an opportunity for something to happen. So we need to watch our irrigation. Uh, along with that, a lot of times we use water hoses, you know, and we may use a water hose if, if we use uh, chemicals or fertilizers, that type of thing where we need to use water. We may use the same water hose for irrigation as we use for filling a sprayer tank. And so what happens when the end of that hose gets thrown into the sprayer tank, we actually get some contamination. So it's always important to be thinking about irrigation and, and are we using are we using equipment that is, is clean? The second one is the uh, fertilizer and pesticide sprays. That I want to talk a little bit about. Uh, we do, of course, use water for fertilizer and pesticide. And I remember growing up on the farm, and I know that when we we used fertilizer, a lot of times uh, we would stop by a pond and and uh, fill up our, our tank through a filtering system that wasn't filtering out microorganisms or bacteria, anything, but we'd fill up our sprayer tank and we'd mix in chemical and we'd go again. And so that is a potential right there for contamination. And then we go out and we spray that on, on the fields and, and so now we've got that issue all over our field. I do want to say one thing about sanitizing though. Sanitizing, our best sanitizer that we have is the sun. So we have, we, we have a way of reducing or eliminating a lot of uh, microbial activity, especially if it's exposed to the sun and to the air. So given time, a lot of that does go away anyway. But it's important that we, we think about if we're going to use fertilizers and pesticide sprays, that we use water that, that we know is, is good potable water or potable water. Washing or rinsing the same thing. Um, make sure that we use water that we know is, is good clean water that's uh, free of bacteria. And I'm going to go through a few more things on that as we go along here. But those are three critical areas when we talk about water. Water sources. We have three main water sources that we use. I mentioned a little bit about a pond or a river, surface water, and that's actually our greatest risk because we have livestock, we have wildlife that are coming up to the water, drinking water, uh, walking in the water. We have uh, a watershed area that usually, and by that I mean it's the area where the rainwater comes off and, and flows into the river or to the, to the lakes or ponds, and, and so whatever is on that runoff or in that runoff area um, also carries those contaminants into the lake. So surface water is your greatest risk. Now I'm not saying um, don't use it and we'll talk a little bit about when we do use it, some of the safeguards that we need to take there. Well water has a moderate risk and, and the main reason for that is, is that uh, we're not constantly um, sanitizing the water or applying anything to the water. So um, there's, I, I've seen situations, particularly in the springtime when we have a lot of runoff and, and there's potential for organic matter that's breaking down and of course some organic matter a lot of times comes in ammonias and nitrates and nitrates and so we get some of that potentially that can get into the groundwater through holes or maybe along the well case and that type of thing. So, we need to be concerned about well water also, especially in, you know, especially at least checking it once a year. And then of course public water has a very low risk because that is being treated all the time. The one thing I do want to say about public water is that it's treated, but it's treated right at the site the, where the, the treatment is going on. And that's great. But say we're two miles down the road we potentially could have something in our pipelines, uh, some type of a bacteria growth. And I, I know I've experienced it on my farm from the well to the house. I've, um, I've experienced some bacteria growth that needed to be treated. And I think the same thing can happen. When they put the treatment in the water and you're two miles down the road, that treatment wears off. 
And so it, it, it should be, if you're, if you're a ways away from, from the treatment plant, you really should think about once a year just maybe testing the water to see what that water is, how that water is. The testing that we, that we do typically is bacteriological and, and nitrite or nitrate testing. And so we have some general guidelines. Now, the, I, I just want to go off a little bit on a tangent here and talk about the Food Safety Modernization Act. And um, when the way that is written is that if if you're going to use surface water, you need to be able to prove that that surface water is acceptable surface water for irrigating, particularly irrigating and probably spraying for pesticides and, and fertilizers. So at first, when you use surface water for the Food Safety Modernization Act, you need to test it on a regular basis. And not, not just three times a year, but more often until you can prove that that surface water is not harmful. So um, that is something where the Food Safety Modernization Act is a little bit different. They do, it's a very similar with well water, where we need to test that more often for a period of time, and then we gradually go away from that, and we can go to less testing on an annual basis. But surface water, you should really check it three times a year. I, I strongly recommend that you check it in the springtime when you first start to use water for irrigation or for other purposes for your field or your produce, then check it in the middle of the summer and then also check it early in the harvest period for that time, someplace in earlier in that period of time. And then well water, I strongly recommend that you check it in early in the growing season. That usually is if there are issues, particularly with bacteria and nitrates, nitrates, it's, it's early in the season. And for public water, don't you know you can always ask you can always ask for a report and those are available to the public. So as you can see how the public water tested if you're using the public water and, and that's a good record to keep. And if you're thinking longer term about um, some of the food safety modernization acts and participating in that particular program, this is something you want to keep. Testing is really not that expensive. Bacteriological and nit nitrates um, cost anywhere from $20 to $55, and usually the ones in the lower range are your, your health districts. They are usually quite a bit lower than, than the, some of the testing labs, but uh, it's uh, it's, it's one I strongly recommend that you do at least once a year, especially if you've got wells. When you take a water sample, you want to be able to take it at the location where you're using the water. So if you decide that you're going to use your well water for your field for irrigating, find that source, that spot, that hydrant where you're going to be connecting up to and take your water sample at that point. Don't take it in the kitchen. Don't take it out in the shop, but take it where that closest location will be. That will give you the most accurate reading for uh, what you need to know. When we when we do do testing, there's usually a, a check that you can get from the health districts. If you're going to the health districts, or there's a kit you probably can get from a testing lab. And be sure to follow the instructions really close on, on that test kit. First thing you'll notice when you pull out a bottle, there's probably some stuff in the bottle. Don't pour that stuff out. Don't rinse the bottle out unless the instructions tell you to. But 90% of the time, don't do anything with that bottle until you're ready to put your sample of water into it. So, and typically what I recommend you do is at that location, let the water run for just a half a minute and then go ahead and take your sample. So there may be something right at the end of the spout that, that you don't really want to, um, which isn't considered a sample for for taking testing. So just here are some of the different uh, locations. One thing also to remember is, is that 
these samples can change very quickly, so you want to try to get it to the lab as quickly as possible. And uh, if you can get it to the lab within hours, that's great. I would never ever say it's acceptable to go beyond 24 hours to get it to the lab. So typically our mail system doesn't work real well. It almost it's point where you need to take it right directly to the lab. The other thing along those lines is try to pull the sample early in the week because the lab is maybe swamped and if you pull a sample Thursday afternoon or Friday morning and bring it into the lab, a lot of times those labs are really, really busy and they, they may not get to it. So just kind of give that some consideration. We'll talk a little bit about uh, soil amendments. And so a, so a soil amendment is anything. I don't care what it is. It's sand, it's fertilizer, it's compost. Um, there anything you add to the soil is considered a soil amendment. And biological soil amendments typically are those amendments that are organic. They break down in the soil. That there, it requires some type of bacterial activity or biological activity. Microorganisms are working. Pathogens are working. So to break down that that organic matter. So that's biological. But we also, in addition to that, have the inorganic or the chemical amendments of fertilizers, a lot of inorganic type fertilizers out there. And we're not so concerned about inorganic fertilizers because there's really not a lot of biological activity. A lot of them tend to be on the salty side, so um, bacteria does not do real well in that type of activity. And in fact, we may end up losing some soil like with some of those types of fertilizers. But uh, it's important to make sure that when you do put in a soil amendment that you, you've thought about that soil amendment, and it, particularly if it's a manure or compost, it's been properly processed. And when I say properly processed, I'm talking about going through a kill stage. And a kill stage typically is where you heat something up to 130 to 150 degrees. And at that point, a lot of microorganisms are killed off. Uh, a lot of weed seeds even get killed off at that point. And so there's a, there are great examples out on the internet. And you can always feel free to, to email me if you want to process on, on organic matter and how to make sure that it's properly cared and properly taken care of and processed. So, but it's important that we remember that that we do hit that kill cycle and that we try to kill as many organisms, microorganisms and see weed seeds as we can. A little bit on equipment. We need to make sure that the equipment we have uh, is clean when we take it out in the field. And you can take an example of this picture here. We know a lot of older equipment maybe have drips on it. Maybe when we grease a piece of equipment, sometimes there's extra grease left on the outside. And so it's important that we wipe that before we go into the field so that we don't get that grease or oil or other contaminants on the, on the fruits and vegetables and the plants and cells. We can also talk a little bit about disinfecting. Normally when you when you have storage bins or you have bins that you brought into the field and you pick produce, those bins should be just used out in the field. They should not be used um, when you bring them inside you know, for clean produce. So we want to make sure that we try to segregate some of the storage bins and some of those type of bins from the field bins to make sure that we're using clean bins after the produce has been cleaned. A little bit about um, disinfecting. We try to disinfect bins as much as possible and in our tools as much as possible, especially that that's touching produce. And the recommend, recommended procedure there is, is, first of all, try to wash off any dirt or oils or contaminants that you can see on your tools or your bins. That's the very first important part. And of course, we usually use a soap or detergent at that point. And then the second part is to rinse those. So at this point, we really haven't sanitized anything, but we but we want to maybe sanitize. So the next point is that we, we take and we dip 
for those tools and some type of a sanitizer. And of course, chlorine is a great sanitizer. And, uh, we use that a lot of times to sanitize our tools. Typically, we'll, we'll have a barrel or a tub or a sink that's got water in it, and we'll put in so much chlorine bleach. And there's a formula that you can go through, but we want to be at about 100 to 150 parts per million. And then we want to be able to let those tools or those bins actually sit in that sanitizer for a minute or so, half a minute to a minute, so that that sanitizer can do what it needs to do. Along the same lines, and we want to rinse that off, and we want to change the sanitizer regularly, especially if, if we're doing a lot of cleaning, because that sanitizer does wear out. And so we either want to add additional, in this case, chlorine, or we want to dump the water and start over again. So. It kind of depends after a while. I think you probably will, you get a pretty good feel for how often you need to change your water. If you're doing very little, maybe once a day is great. If you're doing it more often, then, then uh, if you wash a lot more utensils and equipment, then you probably need to do it more often during the day. Soil hazards. You know, there's not a lot we can do to control the wildlife that goes through the area. And I, I remember when the Food Safety Modernization Act first came out, everybody thought they were going to need to put up 10-foot fences around their, their field so that we didn't get any type of animals or livestock in, into the fields. And that's great, but that's not very cost effective. So it's one of those things that uh, we need to look at a little bit differently. And I'm glad that that has changed in the Food Safety Modernization Act. And so today I think the things that we need to think about when we think about a field or a, a garden plot or even a high tunnel is what can we do to reduce the amount of traffic that we have going through those areas. And just to give you an example, we could one of the things we can do is actually have a buffer strip around the field. And that's typically an area where that's kept mowed or maybe cultivated and a lot of small animals typically don't like to be exposed to those type uh, to those type of conditions, so they don't always cross it. But it's just one one way of, of reducing the traffic into those fields. Another thing may be to use some type of flags or scarecrows or that type of thing. That um, and of course there's there's different types of uh, equipment with different types of sounds and that type of thing too that reduce the amount of traffic that you have in there. When you go out to harvest in a field, one of the first things you will want to do is to walk around that area to see what kind of traffic's been in the area. So if you've had a deer trail go through and and you've got deer in there in particular spots, you'll want to probably work around that area and harvest around that area first and then come back to that area afterwards. Um, and I would never recommend that you use that as, as food, um, but I would recommend that you pick that produce after you're done picking all the other produce so that you don't contaminate produce by with your hands that way. Like you, if you call way back, we talked about our hands are one of our, one of the best sources of contamination that we have. So. Contamination, contaminants will often colonize in the, in the soil and I'm talking particularly when you're talking about uh, manure or, or that type of thing where it, it sits in a pile and so um, it's best to try, to try to remove that from the field as quickly as possible if you do have those issues. You particularly don't want to to necessarily till them in right away, but to try to remove them totally so that um, you don't have that colonization going on. So a little bit of, more about animal hazards. <clears throat> we know that animals have four feet in most cases, birds have two, but we also know that they're not particularly careful about where they walk or where they've been. So we want to make sure that that we do reduce that traffic as much as possible. And if there are 
um, and urine, that type of thing that um, do get deposited in the fields. We want to try to take that out and, and also reduce uh, that opportunity for that to happen. So I've seen it over time and time again where we have pests in the garden, and, and it's a really difficult thing because we think of them as one of ourselves, but we really need to be very careful about allowing our pests to come into the our pest excuse me, our, uh, our our friends to come into the to the gardens with us, our pets, and so uh, we should be very careful about that. I have a I have a dog that just loves to sneak in when I'm not looking, and he knows where he's supposed to be, but it's, it's kind of funny to watch him sneak in five, ten feet into the garden, and then I chase him back out again. One, we, we probably want to maintain some records um, if we do have an animal control program, and that usually ends up um, being more along the lines of maybe mice in a, a wash and pack facility, that type of thing, where we we say we set traps, and we and the records would indicate uh, how often we set traps, and maybe if we're catching mice on a regular basis in one particular area, the records would indicate what preventive action, what things we're doing to reduce the amount of mouse traffic in that area. But uh, there may be some records that you will want to monitor to keep along that those lines. And of course, the very last thing is. Don't ever mix contaminated produce with other produce, with produce that has not been contaminated. So a question I often get is, well, I know this produce is contaminated, but I um, I wash all my produce. Well, to be honest with you, I still would not do that. Because we don't know, from that point, we know that once we put something contaminated in a, in a fruit basket, uh, everything in there is probably contaminated and so every time we handle that we're handling the contamination and moving things around. It's best, like I said earlier, to come back and get that contaminated fruit after you're done picking the produce that you know has not been contaminated. Storage and transportation. One of the areas that if you have a cooler it's always recommended that you keep track of what your cooler temperatures are. And nowadays we seem to have a lot of digital type instruments that, that will keep track of us for, for that. Will, but, and that's great. So if it comes to a point in some time in your future where you decide you want to follow or you want to become certified, GAP certified, this is one of the things that will come up is um, what does your records look like? Um, and cooler records is one of them that will always come up. You need to show that your temperature is maintained at, at what you say it's going to be. You need to make sure that you're cleaning your cooler when you say you're going to clean your cooler. So if you say you clean your cooler once a month and you've got record of it, that's a good starting point. And if you think you use your cooler more often and you clean more often, that becomes kind of your instructions, part of your process, and your record should show that. If you have someone that's hauling produce for you, make sure that they are able to show you the last load that they had on the on the truck. Make sure that they can show you that there's some cleaning records so that you know that they've cleaned the record and it always is worth your time to walk into the truck and walk around and inspect it to make sure that they're cleaning it per your standards. And then also make sure that they've got temperature logs on hand so that you know when that produce leaves your yard that it's going to be properly cared for until it gets to to the consumer or to the retail store or the distributor. And it is your responsibility to make sure that it gets to that distributor or to that retail store. So make sure that those hauling your food, your produce, know what they're doing and have the proper records. When we talk about records, you know, a lot of it has to do with redu about reducing your liability. So what can you do to reduce your liability? Well, we keep records. And that's one of the ways, if, if something were to happen where we were to go to court, um, we could say, okay, 
we check our cooler, here's our records, here's the dates, here's our sign off on it. We know that our produce is being kept at this temperature all the time. Um, we develop those guidelines. We develop guidelines so that if we need to show someone or train someone on what records to keep, on how we do things, those guidelines are there as kind of a set of instructions, or there as a set of training tools, and they're great for following back and saying, okay, here's the records we keep, and here's the guidelines we follow to keep those records. So it's, it's just a great way to reduce reliability. And of course, we just talked about training. Training is always important. I work a lot by myself as a producer, and I go through my food safety policy manual once a year, and I do it for two reasons. Number one is a refresher, because at some point several years ago, I said I was going to do it this way. Well, am I still doing it that way? That's the second point. If I need to change my policy manual, then it gives me an opportunity early in the season to say, okay, this is how I think I should do it. I want to do it today. And so we try to change those guidelines a little bit. And then, of course, the last area there along those lines, reducing your liabilities is to have proper tools and have those tools clean and have them sharp or have them so that they operate the way they're supposed to be operated. Just some other general topics just to talk about. Um, and, I, and I think that when, maybe if there's some questions, we can go through those. But um, visitors. If you have visitors out to the field, they need to follow a lot of the same rules that uh, you follow, that your employees follow. In other words, if they're going to come out the field and you're going to allow them to do some picking, then they, you need to make sure that they know they need to wash their hands. That when they use the restroom, when they come back, they need to wash their hands, that type of thing. So make sure your visitors follow the same rules. Make sure your hand washing and toilet facilities are clean and, and always properly supplied. First aid kits are always important. We talked a little bit about uh, that a while back and that we should try to have a band-aid, uh, band-aids and other supplies available. And then in addition to that, people around you need, whether they're your employees or visitors, need to know what to do if somebody gets hurt. And, and then, and of course we talk about the safety of that individual, first of all, but they also need to know about contamination issues. So always uh, make sure you go over that with everybody. We don't talk always on our on farms about MSDS sheets, material safety data sheets, but we do use different chemicals. We do use different formulas of things, and we really should have material safety data sheets available so that if uh, we have an individual that gets it in their eyes or on their face or whatever, we have a quick reference for taking care of that issue or to getting them to the, the clinic. So, you know, and, yeah, the last thing is consider logs whenever, whenever you think it's feasible. But don't just put logs out there. They have logs out there. Um, and by logs, I mean, you know, a sheet of paper where you write down what you did when you did it. But the other part of that is if, if you're going to log your temperatures for your cooler, and I've used that a couple of times, for cleaning and for temperatures, that log should be on a clipboard right there at the cooler door. Because if it's up at the house or if it's in the office someplace, somebody may come in and uh, they may clean the cooler and may check the temperature, but if that log isn't there, chances are it's not going to get written down and Inspectors will say, if I don't see it in writing, then it never happens. So um, make sure that you, if you're going to have a log, that it's someplace where everybody can use it and it's, it's convenient. I'm going to quickly go over this traceability and recall is just a simple system of being able to know where your produce came from and know where it's going. So and I'll give you the example, the first one I use lot coding system, 050616 one ht one 
Sounds like a lot. So here's what it is. It's May 6th, 2016. Number one is me. I'm the individual. I pick the, pick the fruit uh, in high tunnel number one. So that gives me all the information I need. It's a very simple system. You use a simple, that's a simple system that works for you. But if you're going to be selling produce to a restaurant or a grocery store or a wholesaler, I would really strongly recommend that you put some kind of a lot coding system in place. And if you're going to sell to one of those types of businesses, make sure on the invoice you put that lot code right on the invoice so that way you know where that produce is going. So important to remember, no one step back, know where you where the produce came from and one step forward. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but traceability and recall is often one of those things that um, we kind of step over and then when it happens to us, when the inspector comes to us and says, you know, I think uh, your t tomatoes are suspect, gosh, we better know something about when we picked them and, and what those tomatoes would have gone through. So, and, and it's not, it's, it's a way of reducing our liability is what it is because we want to protect what we have and if we've got something like this in place, that's going to help us, give us some protection. It's also going to help the inspector work through that process and know where where that produce came from or where the contamination came from. And it doesn't always come from your farm. Most of the times it doesn't come from a producer. It comes someplace along the way. We talked about checklists and logs quite a bit. Make sure it's someplace where it's convenient. And then the last part, I've mentioned it several times about the food safety plan. But um, when you write a when you when you write about your food safety plan, you try to write it the way you do things, and so that becomes your procedure. And if you have logs in place, you create those logs and you keep those logs up. It's important that you do that. The last part is reviewing. Um, you can actually there's checklists out in the on the internet. There's USDA um, audit verification checklist. It's a good way to see how well you do in the on your farm plan, you can go through a checklist and, and see how you've covered that in your farm plan. So um, review buildings. Always remember if you're going to write a farm plan on food safety, think about the history of the land and think about those farmers that are farming around you and if there's contamination that may be getting into onto your land or onto your, your crops. That is basically what I have. Here's a couple of uh, good sites. Uh, the FDA has the Food Safety and Modernization Act, and there's a lot of good guidance there. And then also the second one down is the Food Safety News, and that's a daily report I get, and it tells me about producers all over the country that are having these issues, and not only producers, but processors, and so it kind of helps me keep up to date on food safety issues. Julie, I think with that, I'll turn it back over to you. And if, um, if I, I guess there was one question, if I recall, and I believe it had to do with tobacco. It's an employees that smoke or chew or use the electronic devices nowadays. It's um, it's a source of contamination. So if they smoke. Um, give them a time during the day in which they can smoke, give them an area in which they can smoke in, but make sure that when they come back to working with your food that you're producing that their hands are, are washed. Well, thank you very much, Keith. Um, does anyone else have any questions? Just go ahead and type those in the chat pod. I'm going to copy a link to the survey I mentioned where you can give us some feedback and also uh, you should be able to, if it all works, click on this and it'll take you to a survey. But I welcome any other questions. And again, you can win a prize and you can print a, print a certificate. Well, I'd certainly like to thank you, Keith, for being willing to come on. It was a lot easier to do this in our office than having to drive all the way up to see you. <laughs> so technology is pretty neat.
Yes, and uh, it, it really is neat how we can do this from wherever nowadays. Uh, yes. Like I said at the beginning, I really enjoy um, visiting with with everyone on, on food safety and and as producers, if you, some of you are producers out there, think about ways you can reduce your risk. You never can eliminate it, but think about ways you can reduce risk. Well, with that, I will welcome you again to come back, same spot, next week, same time, and you can hear Todd Weinman talk about High Tunnel. So thanks, everybody. Please, please do the survey. I think you'll also get a follow-up from the system, but that would really help us. Thanks again, Keith.